Hi, I'm Dr. Veronica Vax, and I would like to talk to you today about possible causes of acid reflux and the consequences of not addressing appropriately a cause or addressing it inappropriately. I identified about eight possible causes. Number one, poor chewing habits. When you swallow a big piece, it's, got, it's not going to be digested there in the stomach. As a result, little pieces will come up. Too much food in the stomach. Overstimulated sympathetic system. Overproduction of hydrochloric acid. Underproduction of hydrochloric acid. Dilution of hydrochloric acid. Underproduction of bile and pancreatic enzymes. And food sensitivity. Now, if you are not going to address any of those problems, so what will happen, you will have short-term, intermediate or long-term side effect. So let's talk about them. Well, everybody does know about a short-term effect. Once when you have an acid reflex, you have a sensation of burning and pain here in the esophagus and you will run to gastroenterologist and you will get the prescription of uh, PPIs. So suppose you decided you're not going to address the problem because you don't have a severe burning or you get uh, treated inappropriately or the, the treatment it's not exactly address your problem. Then what's happened? Then you are going to have an intermediate side effect. So intermediate by time frame. Over the several weeks or months, you will start to see the effect. What are possible effects is um, clinically it's going to be expressed as irritation and inflammation of digestive tract, which is pain, bloating, diarrhea, constipation or both, and also sense of like you overeat and when or every time when you eat your stomach is just boof, becomes so big. Also, irritation and inflammation in digestive tract will create a further problem. It's mal malabsorption, malabsorption of vitamins and minerals, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, iron, vitamin, D, uh, vitamin B12. Long-term side effect. By the way, I want to say that clinical presentation of those intermediate side effects such as calcium deficiency or magnesium deficiency is already well recognized in medical community and will be probably will be addressed and will be recognized. However, the long-term effect is not very well known. Once when you have a nutritional deficiency, for example, vitamin B12, we know that low vitamin B12 can contribute to cancer formation. So if you are the person who has a family history or have a predisposition to certain kinds of cancer, on top of that you will have low vitamin D that also will contribute to cancer formation. Also, because of the malabsorption, you will absorb less, less protein. As a result, over the time, immune system becomes weaker. Weak immune system also can contribute to, can, to cancer formation. We have a great, great examples. Low immune system, Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, so again, if you are a patient that has a family history of any kinds of cancer, vitamin D deficiency plus low immune system, you have a several contributing factors to a cancer formation. So you can see as a physician, I am very much adamant not only identify the cause, but also treat it, to treat the cause appropriately to prevent short-term, intermediate, and long-term effect of not treating or treating that inappropriately. Now, let's go to the blackboard and I will explain you what, why, and how the things happened.